Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the panel titled, How Can Data Policy Increase Trust in AI Applications? Where we are excited and have a full panel ready to roar this morning. I'm actually going to dive right in because I uh, believe you are all familiar with our panelists. If not, we provided their backgrounds. And so I really want to get to the heart of the matter here. As we've been learning a lot and listening to the conversations uh, yesterday and today, I think one thing is very clear, which is that our world is undergoing an information big bang in which the universe of data is doubling about every two years or so. And we have quintillions of bytes of data that are generated every day. So as we have these streams of data from mobile phones, other d online devices, and they're expanding exponentially, I want to understand, and I imagine a lot of you do as well, how will AI increase and accelerate the trend and of the velocity of information and collected from every day and every facet of our lives. So let's get some different perspectives from our panelists. I'm going to turn to you, Johan, first, because as the head of Geneva Internet Forum and in preparation for UN Data Forum 2021, you have led this cross-sectoral dialogue on digital cooperation. Can you tell us a little bit about how we should be thinking about stewarding data, how should we be using it? What digital technologies do we need to be thinking about to advance trade and transparency? And what advice do you have for those looking to align AI policy with the use of data? Sure, uh, Christina, first the key word from, uh, from your uh, introduction. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you and Red Horizon uh, for organizing, but the key word is cross-sectoral approach. And this is what we experienced during the preparation for the data World Data Summit. This is what we are experiencing in our daily activities. And you have this challenge from here in Geneva among international organizations at university and departments, national governments. And I was surprised that it's a huge challenge for corporate sector as well, how to align different uh, policy aspects. Now, why it is a huge challenge in the past traditional policy issues not related to data and AI uh, were not ideally managed in silos, in security, privacy, human rights, economy silos. Data and AI are accelerating it. And it is becoming almost tragicomic in some situation where you try to deal with the data and AI, let's say in Geneva, if you want to deal it as exclusively trade issue in the WTO, World Trade Organization, or exclusively human rights issue or standardization, and you can uh, mention all of these perspectives. Now, what has AI added to this discussion? Data was in a way passive, let's say, uh, functionally. It was enormously important. We are all aware of it. But suddenly, AI makes that bridge towards impact on the, our daily reality through the simple examples of Google search, through the financial profiling, well, we can list all of applications of AI. Therefore, that gap of relatively passive data, important for us, for privacy, suddenly become more visible. And I think that's the major, major development uh, that uh, we have been hearing, therefore cross-cutting the first aspect, you name it, overcoming policy silos, uh, going beyond uh, uh, connecting the dots, all phrases that are used these days to describe the same phenomenon. But in, in, uh, we have to move from noticing this as a problem towards some practical ways to do it. And I hope we'll discuss some of them today. And second point uh, is this question of AI bringing impact and importance of data closer to our reality. It's becoming almost tangible. And uh, uh, a third point that we should keep in mind is, uh, and I would uh, um, uh, sort of strongly uh, support and strongly encourage to consult EU's policy in AI, is that we start from reality. We start what we have. Do we need new consumer protection law? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does AI change the framework? Do we new, need new privacy law? And if you read carefully AI European Union framework, they said, okay, let's apply existing law. Let's see where we have to adjust the regulation and let's acknowledge what is unknown, known unknown or known unknowns related to the science fiction aspect of discussion. This is very healthy because AI debate is often shaped by, uh, by science fiction framing, which is not necessarily, there is that element of unknown, but many issues are known. Over to you, Christina. Thanks, Jovan. 
Hillary, I, I'm listening to Jovan speak, and he's talking a lot about trust, and he's talking about science fiction. Sometimes I wonder if I'm in reality or if I'm science fiction, and I'm wondering, you know, what is it really going to take for us to trust the system? What are your opinions on this? Well, I just completed um, a sort of two and a half year program on trust and the governance of tech, and it was such a gift for, uh, for us to have uh, um, Margaret uh, Vestea say, on artificial intelligence, trust is a must not nice to have. So I think what we've been looking at is how much importance citizens give to governance as the basis for their trust. So we've all seen this with, with COVID vaccines. You know, it's the approval process of the vaccines has mattered as much as the trust in the vaccines themselves in terms of combating he hesitancy. Uh, and, and a great piece of work from our Center for Data Ethics saying trust in the rules and regulations governing tech is the biggest single predictor of whether someone believes that digital technology has a role to play in COVID, even more so than variables such as people's concern about the pandemic or belief in the tech um, age and education. So the governance itself is a really key um, important factor when it comes to earning public trust. But the two, three very quick things that we, we identified with this, our research showed that citizens trust governance most when they can see it's working, when things are being enforced and baddies are getting put away and actually they can see that people are, are um, penalised for you know, breaking those rules. Um, and I think that the EU has been very innovative in trying to tread that line of high risk, acceptable, unacceptable, and, and trying to take that on. But also citizens have said, be more human and communicative, because actually, where do we get information about AI that is really understandable, really difficult? Um, and people feel more confident about regulation when they know who's in charge of it. So, you know, particularly people like food regulators in the UK, uh, the Human Fertilization and Regulation Authority, 82% of people felt more protected when they'd heard of a regulator. Who even knows who regulates AI? Certainly in the UK, I think the, in the EU, we have a, something a little bit more containable there. Um, but be less aloof, be more open and more human to regulators, which is an interesting thing. Um, and then empower us and to develop inclusive relationships. So also this idea that citizens would like help to understand how to navigate this whole terrain of business and how to engage with businesses and what to ask for and what not to ask for. Help us help ourselves and educate us about these important issues was, was a quote from the research. So I think it's quite interesting. Um, citizens are more likely to trust a decision that's been influenced by ordinary people, by people like themselves. So again, the importance of engaging and involving citizens in the development of governance is really interesting for trust. And PA Consulting did a great do document called, um, it's, it's about um, governance and regulators turning from watchdogs of industry to champions of the public. And I really wish I'd thought of that myself. That's how regulators and governance will earn citizen trust, championing the public interest. Dieter, Hillary just mentioned, um, or sort of posed a question that I'm kind of curious about, which is really who regulates AI? You've been working on the competence network uh, for AI. Who is regulating um, AI at this moment? And what kind of frameworks are we seeing arise out of Switzerland and the EU? Yeah, Christina, thanks so much. Um, when you talk about AI, I, I want to start with talking about what, what you said when you started this conversation, that data doubles every two years. And what does it mean? Uh, my son asked me, what, what does it mean? How much data is data? So I said, look, the data we produce every day worldwide is just to give an example that they can uh, imagine things, that's about the standard swimming pool that you have in your garden, and then you fill it up with, with a hard disk that you have in your computer. That's what we produce every day. And we all say data, that's the resource of the 21st century, where a valuable resource where we have to get the most out of it. And uh, that's where AI comes in because we simply cannot in, in, in the federal government and in all governments deal with this huge amount of, of data. Uh, but there we need the help of AI to, 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 to guide us, to help us, to support us in uh, doing our, our business. And, and coming back to your question, who, who's regulating it? Um, I think 
everybody can and 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 but it shouldn't be not only the governments as as Hilary has said there's important role to corporate society to trusts to individuals that ha can play an important role in, in in how to to earn trust within this field and uh, and talking about it i mean we the swiss we we can we really can sing a song about it you all know we had an an, an, an a vote about a AID a couple of months ago, which we all say, saw. Well, everybody wants an electronic ID that that will go through very easily, and then we lost the vote by sixty six percent, which is a, a, an earthquake for for Swiss standards. And then we also ask ourselves, why is that? How 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 can it be possible that we lost something that we were so certain to, to win this vote? And in the end, we realized we were. Um, talking about AID and the whole topic in a technical manner, but the people, they were afraid they had, they had a bad feeling in their stomach, so to speak. And we were completely unaware of this and we were not addressing it. And that's one of the lessons learned that we definitely need to take um, these, these concerns in, 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 into, into account and, and, and address them. Another example, from Switzerland, I think that's for the whole of the EU. If you read in a newspaper, if you read 10 articles about AI, nine out of these 10 articles are rather negative. They, they focus on the negative aspects, being them true or not, but talking about mass unemployment, talking about social uprising, all the things that will come eventually with, with AI. Personally, I'm convinced they will never come. AI will, will help us, AI will, will become a service helping us to do jobs better, especially on, on a federal level. I mean, if we look at reality, even now in 2021, a lot of work that we do in federal administration is repetitive work, standard work um, that can be made better or, or, or where the output can be a lot more efficient and effective with the support and, and uh, of, of AI. But coming back to your to your question that you really asked um, about regulating in Switzerland, we believe that we shouldn't overregulate things. Uh, that's our belief for, for the past 150 years, and that's the same what we think about AI. Well, you no, know, that's sort of an oh, sorry. Go ahead. Knowing that the fact is that the the tech cycles are simply much faster than, than the legal or the government cycles. And we can try to, 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 to build or, or to create an AI law for Switzerland, but knowing that it takes five to 10 years and in, in 10 years, the world will be different. So back to you, Christina. Yeah, thanks, Dieter. You know, uh, I just, I was listening to you so intensely that, you know, I started to almost react and say, Johanna, I want to look to you immediately because as Dieter was saying things like, Corporate, society, everyone has an important role. I have to kind of look at the role of the business in this ecosystem. And obviously, a lot of times we're very focused on the big tech, which is in the headlines in terms of all the bad things that they're doing and all the data that they are exploding. Um, but then we actually have sort of the rest of the business community that doesn't end up in the headlines because, as we know, nobody gets praised for doing the right thing. You only end up in the headlines for the wrong things or if the government's going to come and rule you uh, more heavily than it has in the past. From your perspective, how do you see sort of the, that corporate role being shaped in the data con policy conversation, especially comparing sort of that Swiss and EU perspective we just had uh, from Dieter to how we're seeing things evolve in the U.S.? Um, so first of all, I couldn't agree more in that um, I think it's super important that uh, business be engaged in the data policy conversation, number one. And I'm going to give you a quote because I'm going to try to thread what Hillary said. Um, Trust is earned in drops, but lost in buckets. And I think that business um, has a really important role to play because we care about our customers. We care about our individual um, consumers that um, ultimately consume all of our data products, right? whether they are generated from AI or, or um, good old fashioned big data analytics, right? 
or just our data products and services and solutions that many, many organizations around the world now create, especially as we've just gone through a time where we are engaging with our customers increasingly in a digital fashion. But it's a lot of change for individuals to understand. And I do think that Dieter's onto something that we have to make it simpler so that individuals can understand what does this mean so that they can understand that swimming pool of data and that they can understand that um, human capacity is running out to wade through all of that information. So we need some assistance in how we do it. And so I think all of those things are really important and that the role of business is that we're the innovators in this story, right? We're the ones who are out there using new tools, adapting new tools, creating new tools. And then we do need to go back and have conversations with regulators because we actually care about the same things. But we also have the role to play of saying practically, pragmatically, this is what's going on and this is what's easy to do and this is what's hard to do as things continue to evolve and change, right? And so we can wind up in a place where if we're not careful, um, we can have multiple regulators, right? Creating multiple laws that ha don't have consistency in definitions, for example, or are actually one regulator is very active in AI, for example, another one's doing data governance, a third one's doing privacy, another one's doing security in different markets in different places. And for global organizations, Christina, that can be very hard to try to navigate and to continue to innovate and try to serve individuals and customers, right? Um, across the globe in an even fashion, because that's another thing that we promise as business, right, that we're going to provide solutions that are going to be relatively the same and stable across the globe. So I think business has to get in and be kind of the pragmatist in the conversation with the regulator, but then also be the advocate for the consumer because we actually, and the individual, right? Because we know what it, people want, or at least we are hopefully close to them because we understand best our products and our services, and we understand how the needs of the marketplace are evolving. So I think we have to do that, but we also have to do that in a really trustworthy way. Right, because if we just run over the individual, and we know, yes, you mentioned, you know, some companies have done that. I don't think we're in it for the long haul. I think if we align all of our practices with the individual in mind, and at Mastercard, we've created our north stars, our data responsibility principles, which actually help us design all of our products and solutions, including our AI practice, so that we are constantly coming back to the individual and what's in their best interest, right? Ultimately, all of our products and solutions, even though we're mostly a B2B company with a B2B2C business and brand, we know that our, our, our products will be consumed by an individual and will touch an individual's life. And so our data responsibility principles are focused on making sure that an individual under, know, knows that they own their data, that they should um, have control over that data, but importantly, as Hillary and Dieter both touched on, that an individual understands the benefits that they're getting from the use of that data. So for example, at MasterCard, that they should understand that we use their data to you know, actually screen out fraud, to provide security, right, as transactions are being processed. And of course, that they have the right to privacy and security. And that in return, we're gonna do some things. We're gonna provide that privacy and security, that we're also gonna be accountable and transparent that we're gonna have integrity in our process, but then we're also gonna innovate with data. And then we're also gonna to try to solve some societal problems and use data for social impact. And I think when, in, when people understand some of those things, then they're less surprised. And I think it's that surprise that Dieter talked about when people then react to, wait a minute, I don't know about this ID number yet. I don't know what that means, that we get the reaction sometimes. And so I think business has a really important role in that explainer maybe um, piece, both to regulators as well as helping individuals understand the changes that we're all experiencing as people, right? Because we all at the end of the day are really people just in different roles when it comes to the changes in society. Natalia, I wanna bring you into this conversation because um, as Joanne, you were talking about, this is fascinating. Um, I really do see the business as having a unique opportunity. I'm not going to say a role, right? Because I've not, I've not heard anybody officially delegate to businesses the accountability to be the explainer, as you called it. But there's an opportunity to be an educator, about uh, to be an explainer. And Natalia, I'm wondering, as businesses 
innovate and do so at a very rapid pace, certainly faster than regulators, faster than a lot of other sectors that might be informing what we're doing in the policy world. How do you see that role of educator explainer sort of evolving or even being created in some startups uh, or newer companies, especially given the fact that, you know, from a policy perspective, what I see is a copy paste in the privacy policies for a lot of businesses, or they have new, um, you know, cookie policies out there that really are not written to the everyday user. Most people can't understand them. And quite frankly, I think a lot of people don't understand as Joanne and everybody else before her mentioned, how does AI even work? It's a new concept. So from a business perspective, is there an opportunity there? How do you see that playing out um, in your day to day? Thank you, Christina. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, uh... Uh, that uh, I will follow the discussion that uh, John and Hillary and the point that uh, they raised about uh, the trust that we need to gain uh, from the consumer. I think to some extent that has been lost in the last uh, uh, years uh, where consumers not necessarily understand why the data is collected, how it is used, uh, why certain AI algorithms are working in the way they work. So I think this is the role of the businesses uh, to regain this trust. And uh, f first of all, uh, without just uh, even relying on uh, the uh, regulations, on the laws, uh, the businesses uh, needs to be proactive in uh, how they uh, communicate uh, uh, the, the necessity of data and usage of AI algorithm at uh, the first place. If you take a GDPR example, uh, I think uh, many businesses, even before the regulation came, uh, in practice, started uh, uh, creating uh, these uh, ethics rules. Uh, for example, not being, uh, not collecting data without customer consent. And I think that this is what uh, allowed them not only to avoid uh, uh, any fines or not to be compliant uh, with a uh, new data regulation, but uh, also to create a competitive advantage and uh, associate it with the value proposition that uh, different companies uh, can uh, uh, create for their consumers. So I think in this uh, regard, uh, uh, the companies and especially startups uh, 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 help uh, to, to be at the forefront and um, uh, help uh, consumers uh, to have visibility of what is going on uh, and give a control, right? Uh, so the trust comes uh, with, with the control. The more the users understand how the data is collected, why it is collected, what the companies uh, are using this data for, and this uh, creates uh, the level of trust uh, that then uh, companies can exploit uh, in their uh, uh, versus their competitors, and then I can create uh, the, the value out of it. And similar with the AI, right? Like in the financial services, I think uh, it's not a surprise that uh, uh, everyone is using AI either for fraud prevention or for risk assessment uh, or for creating uh, uh, alternative uh, products uh, for, for the users. And here uh, again, the question comes, uh, how transparent the solutions are for the consumers? Do they actually understand, for example, the application got declined, why this has happened and whether this was a uh, individual who rejected this application or it was an algorithm? And the product needs to be created on the base of this uh, potential flows of AI solutions. This never will be perfect. Uh, very often we are talking about probabilistic models, right? And uh, th this is where, again, the more transparency the users have, uh, the better uh, they understand the value that the customer can bring to, uh, the company can bring to them. And uh, in, in terms of dialogue, uh, that's uh, the feedback loop that uh, the companies and corporates can create to provide uh, the uh, feedback from the end consumers to the regulators of uh, what exactly they expect, what exactly they need, and uh, vice versa be the educators uh, and, uh, as I said, on the forefront of what is happening in the law, how it is uh, getting enforced, and so on. Peter, um, over to you, because I, I'm listening to Natalia and thinking about uh, the role of the regulators, the role of the business, the role of society, even role of the users in terms of maybe educating themselves, that we have to kind of have a starting point and we have to have some governance in place and we have to have a dialogue. You've been working a lot around Convention 108 and really focused on data protection and privacy, um, especially with new technologies. How do you see that playing out? I mean, who 
And how do we actually start to unravel this big ball of yarn that we have? And we need to kind of get it uh, straightened out. You know, from your perspective and the work that you're doing, you know, what can we expect, especially for industry? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And um, very happy to be on this panel and giving you the perspective of uh, international organization, which have a very high level uh, binding standards uh, since uh, 1949, basically, and 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 uh, when it comes to data protection and and uh, the protection of uh, the private life, um, it's uh, uh, the, the the framework that we are operating in dates back in 1981. So it's definitely, it's not something that. Um, that has started for us with AI, and and I, I I can assure you that trust and confidence was key during this this these years, and and will be key uh, in our work as well uh, for 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 the next decade to come. Um, it's not it's not always easy. It's not always easy to to maintain to gain and maintain trust and confidence at the political level, the expert level, to reach out to all stakeholders to to, to really protect, uh, even from this uh, very high level um, 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 legal uh, standards point of view, individuals and 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 influence in a positive way. Uh, their everyday life. But we have, as I mentioned, the framework that we are operating in since 1981, uh, which is Convention 108 um, that you also mentioned, that now gathers 55 countries um, from three different continents uh, and, and, and sharing the same objectives, which is the protecting of individuals uh, in the digital era. Um, uh, in a, with appropriate uh, safeguards and, and, and guarantees while maintaining um, the free flow of data uh, between parties. So uh, I, I, I think that these are the main objectives that, that, that will drive us uh, uh, through the, uh, through, through, through the, uh, the, the, the developing uh, environment of uh, of AI, which uh, which we were also also very much interested in, and provided guidance for our state parties and 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 also stakeholders as early as in 2017. Well, for us, AI it doesn't start, uh, and the processing of AI, I must say, it's not new. And and somebody mentioned, I was very glad to hear that it's big data. Maybe it's old fashioned, but for us, it's really. AI, it's, uh, in terms of data processing, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, it, 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 it was very well uh, assessed and, and, and analyzed throughout the years. And of course, there are uh, additional ramifications and, and, and maybe complication to a certain extent. But I think the phenomenon for us is not new. And it certainly doesn't start with uh, the protection of personal data, but with protection of human dignity. Uh, uh, at, at, uh, at, at the highest level. Um, it, when it comes to the protection of, of personal data, which will, of course, um, uh, conduct us and which will also uh, contribute to the, to, the, to the protection of human dignity, are also set in the convention uh, and, and its modernized version. And these are elements such as lawfulness of data processing, fairness, purpose specification, proportionality of data processing, and privacy by design and by default, the principles, uh, transparency, data security, and risk management, and on and on. But in our guidelines, we also um, um, attracted the attention on a wider view of the possible outcomes um, of, of, of these kind of data processing and, and to um, and uh, to take a risk-based, risk uh, at, at the same time, a value-oriented approach. Um, so it's, and this view is, it should not only consider uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms, but also the functioning of democrat democracies and social and ethical values. So we don't have time to uh, really unblock all this, but we have seen in the past that it's not only human rights that could be impacted um, with this kind of data processing, but also democracy and, 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 and values that we share um, among our state 
uh, these, these parties. We also believe that rights of data subjects are key in, in, in gaining and, and, and maintaining trust um, in, in, in technologies such as AI. Therefore, a meaningful control by data subjects uh, need to be there. And also including uh, with access of regulatory assistance, which for the time being, most of the time, are ensured by data protection authorities. So basically, that will be the framework we are navigating in. And of course, the uh, future will be very interesting for us. There is an ongoing parallel work at the Council of Europe on a possible uh, AI convention, as you may all know. That was also a topic of a different panel. We're not going to that. But when it comes to protection of individuals and free flow of data, this is what we have. And we are very happy to share with all interested stakeholders. That's a great overview and a lot of uh, details to follow up on there. Um, like you said, I think we need an additional three to four hours minimum just to get the conversation heated up, let alone completed. But Jovan, one of the things that's kind of jumping out at me as we're talking about trust and sort of every player, and even as, as Peter just mentioned, um, when we're thinking about sort of the democratization of data, um, also how democracies function with regard to data, how other countries independently might think about data. You've been in the uh, diplomatic world for a long time, but you also are very focused on internet governance. And it seems like there's a little bit of a disparity when we talk about regulating of data, because we have so many disparate regulators around the world. Joanne pointed out, it's really impossible, almost from an uh, organizational or company perspective, to look across the globe and understand a single unifying AI policy or data policy. How do you see, or you know, is there even a possibility of us seeing a unified or a harmonized policy approach to AI and new technologies, considering the fact that digital just doesn't have boundaries the way other things have historically had geographical boundaries? Well, uh, Christian, I slightly disagree that there are no boundaries. Boundaries exist. Uh, I'm uh, now connecting from Geneva. My data flows through cables via Basel to Frankfurt. And uh, I'm very critical about the idea of cyberspace, which is different space. Everything we do in digital is ultimately anchored in the physical reality and uh, ultimately sovereignty. But your point, I think what you were, what you were pointing to is uh, uh, how to manage cross-cutting and this multidisciplinary cover. It's very difficult. And uh, I can tell you from my direct experience in Geneva that sometimes it's uh, confusing and sometimes on the level of tragic comic. Uh, one country will argue for one issue, free flow of data in WTO, but then in standardization body, it will try to restrict data and then in the International Telecommunication Union, just in the parameter of three kilometers around the place where I'm standing now, uh, they will be having uh, uh, almost contradictory policies. We from time to time go to these countries and gently uh, hint to them that your person in WTO say something which is completely opposite to what you said in the I don't know, Human Rights Council. Therefore, it is a bit of uh, uh, governance absurdistan. Uh, do we need to bring uh, something to re reality? Definitely, yes, because uh, we cannot sustain governance and trust. The word which is frequently used, I'm a bit, bit uh, critical because it's a, like ethics uh, fig leaf for any discussion, but we have to unpack it. We may do it later on. Uh, uh, there is a need to do it, and I think there will be growing pressure but we need to change institutions. We need to find the new ways of governance. And here we have issues of internet governance. We have an excellent report and I would advise you, I will share the link of the UN Secretary General on uh, our common future. Very brave report, which was issued last week, arguing, for example, for one issue, which is important for our discussion, what is the right of future generations? Who is going to protect uh, access right to data from the interest on the future generations? Therefore, a uh, huge confusion, need to do something. I'm not sure that it can be done uh, with any sort of imposition. It, has, uh, it will come as a common sense approach. There are some good initiatives recently. I, I addressed in one room 50 EU diplomats from tech and human rights community. And they started exchanging. This is as far as I know, one of the first initiative of this type in diplomatic uh, community. You need to reduce lost in translation. You need to start uh, using less and less jargon, which is confusing. 
uh, you need to get to the points of the common sense, which is ultimate impact of technology on society. And we have really to clear our language from ethics, debates to, I'm sorry, to trust, which is overused. Uh, to many other, other issues to be much more specific, concrete, and to develop, and with this I will close, uh, functional or talents of boundary spanners, people who can look beyond uh, institutional boundaries. If somebody is involved in human rights, they develop their language, they develop their silos, and silos is there to exist. It's very human to gather with people with whom you share the views or education or corporate interest, but people who can just see beyond the silo and say, hey, hey, by the way, next door, there is something going on in human rights community which may affect us. Those are going to be the key. And I would advise, advise businesses to invest in it because I'm seeing that governments are moving big time, especially after COVID-19 in the regulatory space. They're regaining something that they needed. They lost, I would say, unproportionately in the past. And there will be more and more regulations coming. Therefore, businesses need to adjust and to see data and AI policy in this comprehensive way, beyond silos. Boundary spanners are the key people. If you recruit new people, look for this type of talents that could see beyond the specific silo. Or Joanne, do you think that we actually need more regulations uh, from a business perspective, or is it really a situation where, as you mentioned earlier, businesses are innovating at such an incredibly, you know, neck-breaking pace that regulators just won't ever be able to catch up? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I, first of all, I think regulation has its place. Um, I don't think that um, organizations in business are necessarily innovating at a pace that um, regulators will never catch up. I think that regulation mm -hmm. always lags innovation. I'm, I'm a lawyer. And so when you, you learn in law school that law reacts to society. So that's just the very nature of regulation. It's just the very nature of law because law is meant to regulate what's going on in society. And so business is just a very active part of society and part of innovation. And so um, regulation reacts to its environment. So I don't think we should say, oh, um, business is acting in such a way that it will never be regulated properly, which is kind of what your question implies. I think what I think we've mentioned a couple of times in this conversation though, that businesses have a role and a responsibility to act in a responsible manner, even when there is no regulation. Um, in a previous conversation, we mentioned, you know, the privacy notices and how they are not necessarily doing the job that regulators intended, right? Organizations have privacy notices and they write them because they are required to now and they are very dense and they're very difficult for individuals to understand. They contain all of the information that's required, but perhaps they're not doing the job that was intended which is to provide that clear information that an individual wanted to understand. You can find everything there, but we know that all of us do not read them. All of us do not read every last piece of them because they are so dense and they are for the typical individual just too much. And so what they would rather do is just click and accept <clears throat> to get the service, the product, the coupon, et cetera, right? And so I do think we need new ways of engagement Right, And I do think that that is on business to figure out as part and parcel of the services that they're designing. So I do think it's incumbent upon business as part of innovation to think about the risks of what they're doing, right? I think AI is a new type of risk. I think we do have to be cognizant in the world that we're creating right now with machine learning and AI um, at, at the business level that we're really in the first, first 1.5 generation, right, of AI and machine learning. And the, the, the data, the quality of the data, the curation of the data, the biases that we have to look out for, how we're thinking about the algorithmic process, how we're using observational AI to make sure we understand what the AI is actually doing, or have we introduced some bias into the process or methodology? I think all of those things are super important for business to actually do, regardless of what the regulation is yet requiring us to do, right? So we have to innovate in a responsible manner. Again, I think most businesses want to do that because we want to create 
good, sustainable products and solutions for our customers, right? But I think we also have to be really careful that we can explain what we're doing, right? So back to that explainability question that Natalia mentioned, right? Can and can we explain to an individual what the algorithm is doing because it should mirror what an individual was doing? You know, we have this, I, I think the population has this idea that the machine is taking over and that there will be no human intervention. I don't believe that. I think that if anything, AI is going to require us to be very, very thoughtful with data innovation going forward. And I think that's the role of business. So I don't think it's one where regulation is required. My, my, the challenge for business is that businesses come up with responsible practices and then regulation comes in. And when regulation is either mismatched with prior regulation or in the definitional terms, right? We'll have different definitions of what is, um, I'm just gonna pick on, on what, what, is, what does anonymization mean? or what is sufficiently aggregated, or what is the right kind of notice, right? All of those things require energy, right, for an organization to use to meet the regulation. Meanwhile, right, there are other practices that we are also engaged in that might be actually better at explaining to an individual what's actually going on. And so I do think that we, as, as responsible businesses, do play a role in trying to get better and better at transparency, better and better at explainability, and what that practically means so that, you know, the next generation of users, the current generation of users has an easier time of engaging with this technology. Now, I guarantee that there's going to be another technology that we will be talking about that we will need to also do the same thing with, right? It's part of the innovation of our age. But as we come up with better and better methods of explaining, I do think that's the role. Business has a job to do there. Um, that's the difference right now. Fair. I think that's a very fair point, but I can't help but focus on um, one of the words that you said, Joanne, which is sort of resonating in my brain, which is responsible businesses, right? Because again, I think that there is a universe of responsible businesses um, that are trying to do the right thing, perhaps because it's the corporate culture, right? That's just what you do. That's your culture. That's who you are. You always try to choose the right path. Or perhaps there's a fear of having a rollback on the brand. Or like you said, maybe stifling innovation. I mean, you know, it's all coming from a good place, but we're not seeing that across the entire industry. Oh, and that's, the whole. Well, and let, so let me address that because I think mm -hmm. there's two schools of thought. One, I think if you're a responsible organization, I think that actually helps you in the marketplace. I think that's my company's point of view, that, or, that ultimately consumers want to interact and individuals want to interact with companies they trust. And they do that more often and more frequently. I think that also makes you a more sustainable business for the longer term. I think the role of regulation is to even the playing field, right? Is mm -hmm. to take those responsible practices and actually say, okay, these bunch of companies are doing things in a responsible manner why isn't everybody else, right? Now you have to also look at that for the small business owner and the medium-sized business owner, right? Because we also have a marketplace where some of the bigger, bigger companies can do things easier than others. And so we also have to make sure we are looking out for those inequities in the market. But I do think that that is also part of the role of regulation is to also make sure the market is keeping up with the innovations, right, that responsible companies are coming up with. So I think that that's one of the roles that responsible companies play in the market is to actually encourage these best practices. Dieter, is that how you see it as well from your perspective? And how have you seen that? You know, I think that Joanne's point is very well taken, which is, you know, there should be a voice and there is a role for responsible businesses to play in that ecosystem, both in terms of contributing to the right type of policies we need so that they're right size as well as ensuring that the, you know, the, the, like she said, you know, we have a level playing field, right? Where everybody is having access to the business environment, whether small or large, et cetera, and playing by relatively same rules, if you will. Um, how are you seeing that play out from a policy perspective? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's really important um, to, um, to ensure that, that, that everybody and every stakeholder um, has its point of view and, and has its its take taken taken into consideration. So we we are working in partnership with with uh, with internet companies with uh, 
with other enterprises um, in, in shaping our policy. And this is something that the Council of Europe did in an innovative way, uh, engaging with companies and inviting them to the decision-making table, to the policy-making table, if you wish. Uh, so that, that, that this is something where the other, other way are, um, that I already mentioned, the, the, these two objectives that are, that we really try to stick um, uh, to as uh, the protection of individuals um, by appropriate uh, state safeguards and guarantees while ensuring free flow of data. And this is what we are working on. This is the um, an area of, of, of free flow of data which would enable uh, everybody, every businesses um, uh, to participate on equal footing and not to um, and not to have the hurdle of, of so many um, uh, uh, policies, so many uh, data protection laws, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it, this is something that, that, that is really intention. This is really in our uh, objectives for the future to come. It's not easy to construct, but we have very good partners, the European Union with the GDPR and, and, um, and also um, other uh, European Union legislations are on board. Um, we are uh, we are we, we are uh, in the middle of construction of this area of, of, of convergence towards a high set of standards, which will one day become and we believe soon uh, a free transfer of data area for. Our so you know, one of the things that you mentioned was you know not wanting to overregulate, which makes sense. Um, and having still an environment in which, in which we have the free flow of data where it's necessary. As data is shared and exchanged, you know, which is, I think, a, a fundamental premise for better AI, the idea of data trust is really one that we have to kind of think about, I think, in a more evolved and a mature way, perhaps along the lines of a fiduciary responsibility for the providers. Um, you know, data from a governmental perspective and understanding that you want to sort of balance out the regulation, but also continue to fuel innovation. How does the government strike that from a policy perspective? What's the balance there? Well, Christina, first of all, I think we can work with this model that is quite well known. Maybe you, you know, to just this triangle showing data, facts, and policy, and, and it's always this these three aspects that that we have to consider. So you cannot. Just talk about policy if you do not know about the data in the back and the facts that you have. But talking about regulations, again, in Switzerland, we strongly believe in few but good and meaningful regulations. We do laws in, in a way which we call more general rules and not describing concrete situations that are obsolete a couple of months later. So these general rules, they can apply to new situations and new technologies as well. That's why we are not in, 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 in a hurry or in panic to, to create anything around AI, because we think that the legal fundament that we have in Switzerland is, is, is well-based, is, is good enough and will also be good enough for, for new challenges ahead. Uh, like AI in, 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 in the workplace. And there's one, one important um, point that I think Joanne mentioned, which, which I, I'd like to mention once more, because it's really important for, for, for uh, us as, as a government. The way we will work or the way AI will work for us and will support us is not the black box that is anonymously taking in data and doing or, or, provide, or producing solutions that nobody can understand. Not at all. That's as far away from the truth as it can get. But AI will help our civil servants on all levels to, 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 to make better, faster, more efficient, and more effective decisions. That's the way it is. It's, it's a tool helping us to, be, to become better, to do our job better every day. In the end, we want to serve our country. We want to serve our citizens, our companies, Everybody that's in, I mean, what Jensen, as a company, you can maybe fool your customers once or twice, but you cannot fool them in, in the long run. Uh, for the government, it's the same. 
We want to earn the trust from our citizens and our companies every day. We are not working against them. We are working for them so that they can have a good life, that they can strive, that they can develop. And yes, I also truly believe that innovation in the AI field mainly comes from the corporate side. That's why we have to give them the freedom to, to do what they do. And yes, there will be failures. Failures is, is part of, 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 doing, of doing a job of risking something. And um, then we can, we can help and correct if things really go bad as a government. But we have to give this freedom and opportunity to our companies and societies to develop. And then we take into account what, what is important. And we, we, we do, as I, as I said, so, some basic ro- rules, some general rules helping them. And I'm truly also personally tr- convinced that most of the people, most of the companies, they have a compass, a moral compass that's telling them what's right and wrong. And that will be an important issue too for, for AI. But you cannot, you cannot write it in, down in a law and say, that's the way it has to be. You have to listen to your moral compass. It's too late. Again, tech, tech cycles are just a lot faster than legal cycles. And that's why we believe in, in, in general rules and laws. Uh, describing things in a general way and then saying any new technology that comes up, we take a look at it. And if it needs more special, specific regulation, we work on it, but not in the first place saying, oh, there's something new. Now we have to 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 find a, a way to create a law on AI that has, I don't know, a hundred pages or more in, 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 in 10 years time when it's finally finished. The world, as I said, will look totally, totally different. Back to you, Christine. Yeah, actually, I want to pass the mic over to uh, Hillary because I'm looking at you, Hillary, and going, oh, I know she has a few thoughts, especially when we start talking about moral compass, which is, I think, a fundamental aspect of trust. Um, you know, and if we don't have a moral compass, can we have trust? And how do we balance that out with what's inevitable, right? I mean, if we have innovation, and I think, Peter, your point is a really good one, which is you have to fail, right? If we always were to look to uh, be protected and not to have some level of failure, we wouldn't have innovation. We would basically stifle that, right? It would be overly protected. But when we're thinking about sort of the moral compass and having that be part of the fundamental trust, what really role do we have there? And do you see that moral trust sort of evolving uh, within organizations? Um, you know, how have you seen that play out? Well, it's interesting. Uh, we identified seven what we're calling signals of trustworthiness. So this is not just, you know, academic stuff. This is not just me looking at, you know, different sort of uh, academic research on trust. It was even things like evolutionary psychology. And there are these seven signals which are fundamental to how, even how our society has evolved. So I don't want to even overstate that. And, and that one of those, the number one of that is, is intent. So this idea that that you, you know, your intent has got my good in mind. It's not all about making money. And one of the biggest sources of distrust in technology and governance is the feeling that organizations are putting making money ahead of people and planet. Um, and so when we see the problems with AI, for example, somebody's flogging some software that's using facial recognition and emotional recognition and AI and you know, scraping from your social media to see if you're worthy of a job. Now, A, there's, they don't have the competence for this. Why are they doing it? You know, what's it all about? What is the liability for the people making a defective product? And then also the organizations, for example, um, being discriminatory in not actually asking the questions to find out if the thing they just bought is actually fit for purpose. So there are lots of you know, moral or you know, basic, basic ordinary product sort of usefulness questions to be had. So I, I don't particularly want to go into the moral compass thing. Um, because then you start to go into whose morals. And, I, you know, I love what the uh, IEEE have done, John Havens has done, looking at um, ethics and values in different, in different cultures. They've been looking at uh, Ubuntu ethics and Shinto ethics and looking at how different ethical um, frameworks work in different cultures. And they, they say different things. You know, there are different morals or collective morals or individualistic morals. And so it's not an easy thing to talk about morals. But I just would point you to one thing, because I've spent a lot of time doing um, work on values and ethics um, over the over the last 
<clears throat> number of years. And I just saw something uh, last year about the correlation between a company's stated values and its behaviors. And <laughs> it, it's the, the work's done by MIT Sloan Review, and it talks about how employees feel that their company walks its talk <laughs> and they're reverse correlated. The more they're stating their values, uh, they actually, the, the less they're walking them. So the work that we're looking at now is what is the evidence of trustworthiness? So we talk about trust and Honor O'Neill says it's about being trustworthy and providing evidence of your trustworthiness. And this doesn't necessarily mean signing up for the latest, you know, good for AI for good type thing. It's what are you doing in your organization to keep me safe, to keep whatever matters to me, show that it also matters to you, as Joanna has been saying. So I think that's sort of the, the thing really in terms of this idea of moral compass is, is evidence that your intent and my intent are aligned and you're not just scamming me and you're not just out there to make money at my expense. Natalia, if that's the case, right, and I, I tend to agree, at least that's sort of my premise from a digital policy perspective, right, is you have to have a balance of risk and opportunity. Somebody in the enterprise ought to be accountable, ultimately, for making that um, kind of case. And as Hillary pointed to, somebody who's going to help define the values and then kind of demonstrate how the company is walking the talk and really getting that done. From your experience and, and from your sort of just knowledge, who in the organization should steward that? I mean, should there be a single steward to actually get that done? Who's the right person to tag with that accountability? This to me, again. Um, I was actually going to ask Natalia, but you can actually have I, I didn't too, hear maybe. you say Natalia, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, Hillary, tell us, and then we'll see if Natalia agrees or disagrees with you. And okay, Joanne's yeah. already smirking something well, she might have an opinion too. I've had all these ethics discussions for really 20 years, honestly. Um, what happens is somehow you get this ethics department. So everyone thinks, oh, phew, that's not us. That's them. We'll put it over to them. So then everybody goes, oh, no, God, that's a bad idea. Everybody has to do it. And so then they try and put it in everybody's job descriptions. And that's a mess. And, and so it, but it really is about everybody doing it. And the leadership of the organization is central to that. I, I was on an ethics project recently where they said every decision is an ethical decision because you can choose the sort of scuzzy route or you can choose the, the, the responsible and the moral and the ethical route. Um, and this is where culture and the culture of organizations come in. And that's what I think Joanne was trying to talk to us about. Some organizations have a strong, responsible, ethical culture, some less so. Joanne, you, yeah. you're shaking I'm, your head. I'm, you happy to jump, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here, um, but I do want to let Natalia get in. Um, but um, look, and I appreciate Hillary because I, I, I've watched other companies struggle with this, right? I, I watch organizations struggle with this all the time. They appoint a chief ethics officer, then they, they push it back that it's everybody. I think the answer is that, um, number one, you have to have somebody who's willing to make the hard decisions. So let me first say that. In the data space, it does require that somebody who knows um, how the data works, what the data risks are, and is willing to actually be that, um, that person that's willing to say no when um, the tide of the organization is pushing for a yes, okay? Um, we get really good in my team at saying yes, but, um, which means uh, we like the idea, but you gotta do it a different way, or you need to do more expo explanation, or you need to do more exploration. It, there could be a number of different ways to go there. The reality is that I oftentimes get to play that role in tandem sometimes with our privacy officer, sometimes it's our security officer, there I would say, and the compliance officer, there's a, a group of us, I would say, that play that role um, depending upon the issue. But for data, it's usually me. Um, and I also then have support from our general counsel, our chief financial officer, who acts mostly as our chief risk officer as well, um, from our chief administrative officer, as well as our CEO, okay? And um, those, those individuals have all said to me, that in my role, where I'm, my role is really to um, engender data innovation at MasterCard, but by balancing the risks, okay? And so I have the ability to um, go to any of those individuals and say, look, we have this situation where the tide is pushing hard. My belief is no, and this is why. I have the ability to get their buy-in and to call at any time for the council to kind of come together. That being said, 
our principles are alive at MasterCard. And when we launched our, our data responsibility principles, we, we launched them both for, how, we wanted them externally so our, our customers could understand how we use data, so that our individuals who use our products could understand data, for our partners to understand how we use data. But what we found is our employees, to Hillary's point, really, really then adopted to understanding how they needed to behave and how they needed to think through how we use data. And we use it in our product development. We use it in how we sell. We use it for and customer service. And for them, I think it's also come to life. And so it helps them in their micro decisions because that's really where this issue of data responsibility, and yes, you can use ethics, but I, I'm with Hillary that Ethics are really hard when you go country by country, value systems, it, it gets harder. But that, the data responsibility framework has helped our employees make those decisions in their specific jobs, right? And then when they get harder, we've, we've set up governance so that they know how to roll up those questions, ultimately, oftentimes to my team. But then also, if it's really, then there is a support network above. But it is important that there's someone in the organization or an organization that, that people can go to from a data perspective. At least that's how we do it at MasterCard. But I do want to let Natalia get in here. Uh, I tend to agree what uh, Hillary said. I think uh, that, at least uh, that's how it works in our company that the responsibility is uh, everyone's to look after data, to look after the AI algorithm that I used. Uh, however, having said this, uh, there definitely should to be um, uh, uh, senior management uh, strong uh, strategic take on this. Uh, if uh, there are policy documents, uh, but then at the same time, uh, the senior management uh, create uh, the product uh, that uh, doesn't uh, uh, doesn't follow the uh, requirements and uh, the policies, then no one in the company will continue doing this. So it's uh, really about uh, everyone uh, having an eye, but also the CEO, the chief data officer, the CFO, taking care uh, of uh, these uh, uh, policies and these guidelines to be respected. So I think uh, what it also means that there needs to be a strategic senior view of uh, how the data is used, how AI algorithms are created, not only to create AI algorithms for the sake of creating this and then, uh, you know, create the marketing around it, we are AI driven company or whatever it can be. But uh, as uh, previously been discussed a lot, to make it responsibly, do we really add value to consumers or to our product uh, that inevitably uh, create uh, the value? Why we are using AI and why we are not using traditional methods of doing things, right? Why certain data uh, is used and required in the same way as uh, it will create additional value to the consumers. So uh, I think uh, th that needs to be uh, really translated into all levels of organization, but primarily driven by the senior management. You're both making uh, my heart so happy uh, because I think that there's such a role for governance, but governance is always seen as an evil thing. Whereas I think both Natalia and Joanne, um, you're describing, Hillary, you pointed to this as well. A really governance is an enabler, right? It's something that can actually fuel innovation. It can give you a path to innovate within that framework, if you will, very safely in a way that we know that we're creating um, value for the enterprise, but also keeping the minds of the end user um, with us and making sure that there's a really good level of trust. I love Hillary's cat in the background, also coming to the conversation. But uh, I want to invite some other folks into the conversation here, which is are the folks that are in the audience with us today, and they probably have some questions for you. So let's uh, go over to Adriana. Maybe she can help us out with some questions that we've had from, uh, from folks. Thank you, Christina, for the floor. Our audience has not asked many questions. I do believe that was due to your master for moderation because you asked the speakers quite a lot of questions. I do think that the audience's curiosity was sort of sated through that, but we did have two questions. From Ms. Aisha Piotti uh, to Dieter, isn't the reason why the Swiss approach works because Switzerland is a, a small uh, country which is relatively rich and therefore has an incredible enforcement capacity? And Ms. Deborah Webster asked, shouldn't companies preempt 
where regulation will go if they don't keep themselves in check. Now, Jovan already um, reacted to this in the chat, and he noted that there is a gradual shift towards ex ante regulation from traditional ex post regulation of technology. And he gave the example of Libra, where Facebook wanted to move forward with the new cryptocurrency and see what to do with regulation later on. However, they faced red light from financial regulations. So Yuman's best guess is that we'll have more ex ante regulation. And I wanted to give an opportunity to the other speakers to reflect off on this as well. That will be all for me, Christina, at this point. Back to you. Great, thank you. Well, I want to just pause for a moment and allow anybody else on our panel to react to any of the questions or any of the comments um, that were made. If anybody has anything else to add, um, let me just for a moment pause and let you do that. No? Okay. Well, then I have a lightning round question um, for everybody on the panel, which I know everybody's been eagerly waiting for. Um, but I want to just sort of go down the line and ask everybody for one thing in the next year that you think could increase trust in AI applications. Dieter, I'm going to start with you um, from the Swiss government side. Yeah, um, we have just started or we've been working for two years actually on, on our competence net, network for AI and why we're doing this. The simple answer is because we truly believe that AI is teamwork. So, Successful AI projects cannot be made with a single man who's coding anything. He was given just any order and then he's coding any program and software and thinks, oh, oh, that's a solution. We truly believe that AI is teamwork, bringing together lawyers, mathematicians, software engineers, management, everybody to discuss what is the problem, what solutions would be possible, what solutions can be achieved in a traditional way and what solution can, can be achieved with the support and help of, of AI. And that's basically the, the main reason why we, we put in place or why, we, why we're establishing this competence network for AI now, because we as a government, we are simply not able to have all the knowledge and to know all the things that are going on in there. That's why we try to do the network part. We want to bring academia together with the corporate uh, level of Switzerland, with individuals, with universities, with government on cantonal level, you name it. All together, they all have their questions. They all have their, their ideas about what, what AI could do for them, how, they, how AI could improve their daily life. And what, what we really do in the first phase now is what we call in, in German, we call it digitale Aufklärungsarbeit, digital basic educational work, just telling them or, or trying to educate Switzerland as a whole, what, what AI is, what AI can do, how it could help improve our daily lives. And just to give you one very concrete example now of what we're doing on, on, on federal level on, on, on um, custom services at the border, there's around 10,000 trucks crossing the Swiss border every day, every day. And now how you want to control them, that's impossible. Uh, so we want to pick up those few dozens that look suspicious. That can be done in two ways. You have very experienced people at the border who do the control, who know what, what to look for, but we, we have not enough resources. And AI helps us with, with models that we built, identifying trucks in the first place who could be risky. Give you an example, import of tomato usually comes in summertime from the south, from Spain, and in wintertime comes from the north, from, from Netherlands, where they have all these huge artificial fields. So if it's different, uh, coming a huge load of, of, of tomatoes in, in a truck, maybe from the Austrian border, then that might be suspicious. And combining all these information helps us to create models that are much better than all the best experience we have, uh, all the best experience people we have at the 
border. And that's what is in the end really all about that AI helps us to be better in, in, in our daily jobs, to be more productive, more effective, more efficient, because these scarce resources that we have, these people at, at, the, at the customs at duties at the frontier, they want to do, to do a good job and we want to enable them doing helping to do a good job. So education and enablement, that's your big one for the next year, it sounds like, very tall order. Over, Natalia, to you, thinking about the one thing in the next year that could increase trust in uh, AI applications, what would it be? I would uh, argue transparency. And uh, this is because uh, I think uh, people still uh, at different levels, uh, corporates, regulators, uh, understand AI uh, with a different language, understand it uh, differently. For many, it's still a buzzword. But uh, I think uh, th there is a, a lot has been done uh, in uh, the research and the practical application of AI for people to understand what it is about. And people fear what they don't know. They don't uh, understand how that works. So I think uh, creating uh, this transparency, creating the awareness of how the algorithms work uh, will uh, increase inevitably the trust for AI applications. Great, Joanne, you're shaking your head. What, what's your one thing that you wanna kind of put out there? Um, I agree that it's transparency. I think that we need a, a simpler way to explain how AI works, that it is um, partly the, the data inputs that it's um, analytics at a very complicated level. I think that the word algorithm is not something that uh, the average person is still comfortable with. So what is an algorithm? How do, what does that mean? So data to the explainability of what, how an algorithm works to the outputs and the process and then the benefits, right? I think that those key parts have to be explained better. We have to do a better job of the transparency. And then to Dieter's point and Natalia's point, by doing that, in situations where individuals can understand how the AI is providing benefits and, and then really giving them places where they can come and ask those questions um, is gonna be increasingly important so that they can engage and, and really learn how things work and how they impact them. So I think it's all about that transparency and engagement. Great, we're running um, close to the end of our time together. We have two more minutes. So we have education, transparency, and a simpler way to explain how AI works, don't use algorithms is what I'm taking away from that point. Really quickly, Hillary, one thing that can increase, uh, increase trust in AI applications. Um, empowerment of citizens to ask better questions because we're acting here as if AI is all great and all we need to do is communicate. There's some really crap AI out there and we really need to make sure that citizens are empowered to ask better questions uh, and really scrutinize the governance and the companies providing them. Perfect. Thank you. Peter, what's your perspective on that? One, one answer. We just need one thing that you think the next year we could do to increase trust in AI applications. Yeah, it's very difficult in an organization where so many things are happening, but I try to give you one of, uh, the, uh, one of the main uh, idea that is already in our guidance that I referred to earlier on. It is the participatory forms of risk assessment, being it at corporate level, being it at, at state level, and also at international level. I would like to invite everybody to, uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to uh, assess the risk about uh, AI, uh, in a participatory uh, manner, and also uh, attached to that, algorithm vigilance programs and 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 schemes. Perfect, Jovan. Fifteen seconds over to you. Uh, what is your your thought on this? Well, instead of talking, I have a drawing. Uh, basically, okay. bringing uh, from the cloud of values, bringing to our reality through implementing all of these values that in influence us from making simple clicks to making a big corporate decision or national laws. And here, are, here is the arsenal that we have from human rights law standardization. Therefore, implementation. And the last one and a half point, make sure that uh, future AI scientists read uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. It is uh, as uh, relevant today as it was 200 years ago. Our good efforts, our curiosity could create uh, a counterintuitive developments. Perfect. Thank you to all of our panelists today. It has been a pleasure. I know we just touched the surface 
hopefully we can have you all come back and share with us in the next round because we definitely need to take this conversation, I think, much deeper. But I appreciate all of your perspectives and the time that you spent, spent with us today. And to the audience, thank you for uh, coming in. If you have additional uh, questions or if you have additional comments, I'm sure all of us will uh, continue to have our ears open and you can reach out to us in one uh, channel or the other. So until next time, take care. Mm -hmm.